as Jenny alluded, and I think most of you in this room probably are aware by now, Howard Callahan, Department of Ag's Nutrient Management Program, basically working with the ag community in this region. I have an office in Talbot County. Um, Talbot, Queen Anne's, Kent County has really been my primary focus area in the recent years, but in the last two years, or excuse me, the last year of also doing Carolina and Dorchester because co-worker retired, so been spread a little thinner, so they maybe haven't seen me as much, which I haven't had anybody complain yet. So, <laughs> you know, again, a lot of things that I'm going to tell you today, I think you've probably already heard, so I'm going to reiterate some things. Um, don't hesitate to ask questions. Again, I'm here to try to help you the best of my ability. You've heard a lot of things from the agronomic side today. Um, for production, I'm going to hit you from the regulatory side of what we got to deal with in the state of Maryland. Again, the key thing Jenny touched on, annual implementation reports. Um, basically, if you're an ag operation in the state of Maryland, you filed a nutrient management plan with the Department of Ag. We're looking for an annual report every year. They were due March 1. 2017 form basically looks just like 2016. It was bright green. There was no new questions added. So I think you're probably aware. Uh, if you haven't done one, Better get on it, you know, time's a ticking. I don't want to sit here today and tell you how many I got, but I can tell you I've got a lot in the last three days. <laughs> just a few little policy changes in the last six months or a year just to make life a little simpler in a few cases. Doesn't apply to everybody, probably doesn't apply to most of you. Uh, just want to touch base on it so you're aware. Needless to say, if you're using manure generally and you need a manure analysis to know what you're putting on as far as nutrient management plan, Basically, if you have an operation that has less than 20 animal units, um, they're allowing you to use a book value versus taking an actual sample based on cost. Um, so again, it's less than 20 animal units. An animal unit is 1,000 pounds of livestock. So small, little livestock operations. Or if you're importing manure or organics, in this case, to your operation, and you're going to use it on less than 25 acres, you can use a book value versus an actual. From an agronomic standpoint, yeah, you probably should take a sample. But from a regulatory standpoint, we're saying you can use a book value. Again, it has to be University of Maryland book value. So that's just helping a few little scenarios. Another thing was basically uh, talking about small grains. And when I say all wheat, barley, rye, triticale, oats, I don't know what I'm missing. But, and if you're using nutrients, in the, basically if you're using manure in the fall is what this is focused on, but not poultry manure. Doesn't apply to most people in this room, but it applies to people in parts of the state. It's really focused on liquid manure, dairy manure generally in the state. Basically, in a nutshell, if you looked at the university's recommendations, and if you had wheat for, if you planted small grain for pasture versus for silage versus for harvest, the fall application recommendation would vary from 20 to 50 pounds. Um, so you ran into a dairy situation generally that the guy's going to plant Wheat, he knows, hey, I'm looking at the seed, I know it's wheat, but I can't today guarantee you that I'm not going to harvest it for silage. I can't guarantee you that I'm not going to pasture it. I can't guarantee you if things go accordingly that I don't need it for that, that I'm going to harvest it for grain. So it's like, what do we call it? Um, so people were up in the air. So needless to say, the most allowance in that fall was up to 50 pounds of plant available nitrogen. And that was geared on silage or pasture production, getting maximum fall growth for forage. It's probably not ideal if you're gonna do it for grain, but in a nutshell, if you ran into that situation, it's on-farm generated manure, it's not manure you imported, they're basically letting you treat it all up to 50 pounds, or we are letting you treat it up to 50 pounds. Um, so it's just something to be aware of. You didn't need to do a full soil nitrate test in that scenario. Again, I don't think it applies to most people. Uh, another policy change was to do with tissue sampling in fruit production. Um, in any kind of fruit production, reality tissue samples are used really to make your agronomic recommendations once you get past establishment. Um, soil samples still do play a role in there, but it's really tissue analysis. Again, if you have small acreage of tissue fruit, and that's saying basically uh, this tissue sample is no longer a requirement, but it basically says it applies to blocks that are less than an acre, so really small. But we run into a few that, you know, got a half acre of peaches and a half acre of apples and a quarter acre of blueberries, and you know, they probably got 10 acres of pumpkins and something else, you know, all kinds of the above. 
they don't have to take a tissue sample. Again, they can rely on a book value, but again, it's only based on their nitrogen application. So anything other than nitrogen, they're gonna to need to take a tissue sample. But it's just a way to give a little bit of leniency in a few cases. And, and so I just want people to be aware, just in case you hear about it. PMT, nothing new. I'm just gonna reiterate probably the same stuff I told you last year. Um, but refresh some memories and let you know where we are at this point. Again, PMT regulations changed back in 2015, went into effect uh, 2016, and basically no phosphorus on fields if you have a 500 FIV fertility index value or greater in the state of Maryland, you were immediately banned from applying any phosphorus to that field for any source. Doesn't affect most people, but it does affect a few. <clears throat> Again, those regulations are in effect and basically what they really, the transition starts right now, 2018, we're here. Um, and basically it begins a transition phase for operations that are what we call in tier C. Basically operations that it's gonna to apply to are in one of three tiers. You're an A tier, a B tier, or a C tier. And I'm gonna go into that and it's on that one page handout will help a little bit clarify some of that I think. Um, and basically, so again, tier C are gonna start implementing this year towards PMT, again, followed by tier B in 2019, so next year, followed by tier A in 2020, so the year after. Again, PMT regulations required consultants basically to report soil test FIV. If you remember back um, in 2015, that was done in 2016, so a couple years ago, consultants had to turn in phosphorus soil test levels for all plans that they wrote for operators. Came in anonymous, Basically, there were spreadsheets that were being sent in. The consultant would say, here's a field in Dorchester County that's 25 acres, and here's the phosphorus soil test level. That's something that was current at that point. Um, there was another spreadsheet sent in that listed the farmers that information was on the other spreadsheet. So generally what happened in most cases, the consultant's working with several operators, so his spreadsheet might have 10 farmers listed that he says, this is farmer one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, but he's got names, so we know who they are. And then the other spreadsheet was all of those people's soil samples. We could identify that this one's Dorchester, this one's tall, but this one's this many acres, but we, didn't, we couldn't make the link back to say, this is your sample on your farm. So it was just basic, broad data information because kept getting asked a lot of questions about phosphorus. Well, what are the levels? Well, we've seen this, we've seen that. Well, how many acres are there? We don't know. So this was in theory to try to capture basic, broad perspective of what we thought was out there. Again, regulations required it in 15, which was done in 16, and the regulations say we gotta do it again in 2021. So it's a couple more years from now, we're gonna go through that cycle again. We'll give you a little synopsis of what that showed. <clears throat> from a statewide data, Again, as of August of 2017, so six months ago, so it's not right up to date, but not much has really changed since then, I can tell you. Um, total acres that we had based on annual implementation reports, AIR, in 2014, in other words, in 2015, that would have been the most current data we had at that time, was 1.2 plus million acres of land that we had that we knew that we were in theory, looking for soil test data from. We got 1.1 million at this point. So we didn't get them all. We got 86%. That turned out to be a little over 75,000 fields throughout the state. <clears throat> Based on that data, soil tests less than 150 FIV, which means you are not affected at all by PMT, none, because it doesn't start until you're 150 or greater, was 79% of what was submitted. If you're between 150 and 499, you're the ones that have got to start dealing with PMT, depending on your transition period, depending on what you're doing with phosphorus. It's assuming you're still applying phosphorus. That's 19% of what was submitted. Over 500, which basically were cut off, was 1.6%. So this is the group short term that we're looking at. Again, based on statewide data, that 79% of the acreage, again, not impacted, that's less than the 150, that was 877,000 plus acres of the 1.1 million that was submitted. 
20% represented at 227,000 plus. They're basically over 150. That includes the few that were over 500. Those are all impacted to some degree by PMT. Either you were cut off because you're over 500 or you got to start transitioning into this new tool. Again, MDA is still working to try to get those other 10 plus percent, those other few hundred thousand acres. I hate to say we'll probably never get them, but we'll probably never get them. I mean, I can only speak for the counties that I'm familiar with. In some cases, we've, to our knowledge, we've exhausted all the information that we think we can get from farmers. For an example, all the farmers in Tolby County, and I'm thinking Dorchester and Queen Anne's, we have gotten data from, but we're short on acres. So we can only make the assumption someone just didn't give us all the information. So we don't know what, we can't go back to the farmer, because one, we don't know who was short, <laughs> and two, we don't know exactly what we got from you. So. There are some counties that are still working on some data that we don't have from specific individuals, but it's not very prevalent on the shore, trust me, it's other parts of the state. So we're still working on that. Just to focus more on local. In other words, I include it because they had stuff broken out by upper shore, mid shore, lower shore. I took Cecil to Dorchester, and again, I'm doing all of these currently except for Cecil. Again, based on that 2014 data, we were looking for a little over 500,000 acres. We got 474, we got 91%. So if you remember the state average was like 86, so somewhere else, other parts of the state had to be in the 80s, you know. So we're, I think we were at the, what I call the top of it. Uh, again, 83% of what was submitted was less than 150, not affected at all by PMT. 16 and a quarter percent was between 150 and 40, 499. Quarter of a percent was over 500. Then I'll give you some acres on that. Again, based on that, 83.5% from the what I call the upper mid-eastern shore does not include the three lower shore counties, does not include Wicomico, Worcester, Somerset, which really are a little bit of a hot area. Again, that 83% represents almost 400,000 acres, has no impact. The 16% re represents 78,000 acres that will have an impact, assuming we're still applying P. The 20, again, the 2015 regulations, again, banned if you're 500. The tier group reporting was done in 2016, and that basically came in, and it did identify the operator, and that basically all soils test fields that you had that were 150 plus, <coughs> excuse me, your consultant took that information, and just to say you had three, and you got a 200 and a 250 and a 300. Those three fields only were added together, divided by those three fields, and said the average over 150 number was this. That was submitted and identifies you as an operator, so hence we can put you into a tier, which is nothing more than a transition schedule. Again, 1,600 operations were reported to MDA. Again, it represents at least one field in that operation that's 150 or greater. It was 11,000 plus fields in that scenario, represented 187,000 plus acres. Tier group A, which if you were to remember back, doesn't even start implementation until 2020. In other words, they're the lowest. All they did, all the MDA did, or what the regulations required, is within the people that were from 150 to 499, it grouped them into the lower portion, the middle portion, and the higher portion, with the assumption the guy that's the highest probably has potential to have the most impact and may have to make the greatest changes. So hence, he's going to start transitioning sooner with a trickle-down, wean-down effect, if that makes any sense to you. <laughs> um, so anyhow, Tier A is the, is the lowest group in that. So again, they're 150 to 299, so they would have nothing greater than 299. <clears throat> they're going to start transitioning in 2020 under what's called a Phase 1. Three years of transition, 2020, 2021, 2022. The PMT basically, as it stands in regulation, says 2022, we're all supposed to be implementing it fully. So between 2018 and 2022, it's a transition to get you to where we want you to be come 2022. That's the intent. Again, so based on this group only, 1,300 operations, 8,000 plus fields, 122,000 acres, 79% in this, in this group. Tier B, which is now, we're from 300 to 450, so it's the next highest group without getting really, really high. 
Again, they're going to start transition phase in 2019, so next year. Again, so they're going to transition from 19 to 20 to 21 to get to the same place in 2022, hopefully. 252 operations, 2,800 fields, 54,000 acres, 15% of what was reported. Tier C, which are going to start transition this year, 2018, their levels are at least 450. <clears throat> but again, 500 is cut off, so it's only people from 450 through 499. They're going to start phase one transition in 2018. So they're going to get five years to get to 2022's ultimate goal. That makes sense to you. It's a little com complicated. That one-page sheet has it kind of laid out a little bit, and I'm going to go through it quickly. But again, 96 operations, 700 fields, 10,000-plus acres, 6% of what was submitted. That's the same thing. It's just in a table form. If you just look, Tier C, again, greater than 450. If you look in 16 and 17, which are come and gone, we were doing phosphorus site index, NPMT as a comparison in your plan. 2018, they're going to start transition management one in 2018. They're going to do the same thing in 2019. Come 2022, we're going to ramp it up, or excuse me, 2020, we're going to ramp it up a level. They're going to go to transition management phase two. So they're going to do phase one, phase two, PMT. And all that is, and there's another table, it's a trickle down effect to get you over here. C is going to do the same thing. They're just put off a year. I mean, excuse me, B is going to do the same thing. They're just put off a year. They're going to start in 2019. Tier A, which is the lowest of that group, are not going to start transition until 2020. They're just going to have a shorter time to get here, but in reality, you've probably got to make less changes. This again, transition over time. Ultimately, we're all going to get to PMT over here. Okay, this is really 2022. Your risk category from your PMT, which is your phosphorus management tool that your consultant run, for that specific field with its specific soil test, with its specific characteristics, soil type, slope, distance to water, um, how much P am I going to put, is it two tons of manure, is it 50 pounds of starter, is it blah, 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 you know, all that's calculated into that risk. And it's ultimately going to put you in a, it's going to give you a score, which is going to say I'm low risk, I'm medium risk, I'm high risk, based on my specific scenario. <clears throat> when you get to PMT, for an example, if you are high risk and we're in 2022, no additional phosphorus. That's tier C people. Let's just say they're going to start this year. But when they start transitioning in phase one, they're going to be limited to one year's worth of crop removal. So in other words, we're not going to cut them off at the knees and say, you're done. You're going to give a man opportunity to regroup and say, oh, I've got to cut back. Let's assume he's been doing two, three tons of chicken litter, which is, I'm confident, it's greater than one year's worth of crop phosphorus removal. He's going to have to cut back, and then he's going to do two years of phase one. He's going to do two years of phase two, which basically is saying we're going to cut you in half again and then get you over here to where it's going to cut you off, if that's the scenario. And the logic in that is if the guy has manure that he has to find a home for, it's giving him an opportunity to help find another home or someone come up with a bright idea of an alternative use, whatever that may be. Um, so we don't end up with what I call piles of manure sitting around that no one has a use for. And again, it hopefully it's not going to be every field. It may be you can open your eyes and say, hmm, i got to look out for these fields. You know, I've got some in my operation, but that's the intent. So again, just a look ahead. When we get to 2022, if you're low risk, you're going to be limited to three years of crop phosphorus removal, which means I can't put more phosphorus out in any one application than three years worth. If I'm medium risk, I'm be limited to one year's worth of crop removal, which means I can't put more than one year's worth of crop phosphorus on at any given time. If you're high, you're going to be down here. We're not going to see, I don't think, a lot of people in the high, but there are going to be some. It's more site specific than it is based just on the soil test level. There's a lot of site characteristics that have an influence, great influence. Again, this is that same thing. That's the one page sheet. Um, that I handed out, it's telling you the same thing that I just went through. In phase one, if you're low, you're limited to phosphorus crop removal for rotation of crops for three years. If you're medium, you're again, rotation of crops for three years. If you're high risk in transition one, you're going to be limited to crop removal for two years. Again, if you're over 500, it doesn't apply because you're cut off. Transition management two. So basically, we're going to have one or two years of phase one, 
one or two years of phase two, and then everybody getting there. It's a wean down effect. Um, it's going to be a little difficult to keep track of, but that's the intent. <laughs> um, again, doesn't have anything to do with nitrogen. Um, again, you're just limited to your phosphorus. And again, this is based on come 2022, so now we're at full PMT implementation. And this basically just tells you what the restrictions will be. It's the same thing that was in that table before. Take home messages. If you've got soil test greater than 150, come 2022, you will have a phosphorus restriction. It's just a matter of am I limited to three years worth of P, two years worth of P, one year's worth of P, or no P. You're going to have some limitation that currently you may not have because you currently, if you're low risk in PSI, you have no phosphorus restriction. It says go do whatever you want to do with that scenario we just ran, which is maybe four years worth of crop removal. I mean, I don't know. Um, but you're going to have some, some limitation. But reality, until you get up to the mediums or highs, it's probably not too cumbersome, in my opinion. Oh, just to back up real quickly. If you're high risk, if you remember in reality come 2022, no phosphorus basically can be applied. But there's a few exceptions to the rule. If you're certified organic operation, you're allowed to be going to be allowed to do phosphorus crop removal for rotation of crops for two crops. And the argument came to light and was put into the regulations. If I'm growing on an organic scenario, it is really hard for me to do it without any manure. So they basically said, okay, we're going to let you not play by the same phosphorus rule. If you take tissue analysis, and I assume you show a phosphorus deficiency, they're going to, even though you had a high risk category that said you could not apply this P, they're going to let you do 25% of crop phosphorus removal for that, crop, for that crop. So it's not a lot of P, but a little bit of P. Crop removal is a number that most of us probably aren't real accustomed to, we don't really use, but it's something you probably should get familiar with if this is the case. And all that is looking at is taking the soil test right out the window. It's not saying what Kripal just said, oh, you got enough in the soil, you don't really need it, why put it out there? This is looking at the assumption, based on research, if I take 50 bushels of beans away from this acre, put them in the truck, haul them down the road, that how much phosphorus is in that green that went down the road that was physically removed from that field. So you may have 75 pounds of uptake because it's growing the plant, it's growing the stalk, it's growing roots, it's growing the leaves, but in reality that's all staying. It's what's in the grain. So there's research, there's data, there's tables, your consultant has them, I have them, that basically gives us an inclination of how much phosphorus is removed from a crop. Give or take a little, most of them are going to be in the 50 to 60 pound per acre range. That's about crop removal for most crops. Needless to say, the more bushels you take, the more is going away. And then again, if you've done something on your farm to reduce the phosphorus in manure, and that's some kind of technology, I think, that you've created at least a 75% reduction in that phosphorus, in other words, you've spent dollars, put in something to do that, then you're going to be allowed to do 50% of crop removal of two crops, which I read to say would be annual crop removal in a sense. That came to light with at least I know one farm in the region. It spent a lot of money, it was a dairy, putting in some technology to remove phosphorus from the waste stream, or at least reduce phosphorus, not completely remove. And, and I don't know that you can completely remove it, but you can reduce it. That cost a lot of money, and, and the... the question was raised or the concern was raised, I've just spent a million dollars that you're going to come around and kick me in the knee and say, you're high risk, you don't get to put that manure that you just spent a million dollars and taking 70, 80 percent of the pee out, you don't get to use what's left over. So that was put in there for that scenario. Don't think it's going to be widespread, but it's there. Uh, again, that's kind of the end of PMT. Anything hot burning questions on what I just went over? Again, don't hesitate to call me, email me later, talk to your consultant, whatever comes up. You know, we're going to try to get through it. Just to reiterate um, some incorporation, when I'm talking incorporation of manure. Basically, again, when that same time frame, there were some regulations that changed that said you may not have to incorporate manure. But generally, you should be, you definitely should be incorporating manure. And in most cases, you probably have to incorporate manure. 
So I'm just reiterating what's already in play. This is exactly word for word right out of the regulations. It says organic nutrient sources, so that's anything other than commercial fertilizer, shall be injected or incorporated as soon as possible, but no later than 48 hours after application. Except those farms, this was added, except those farm operations that choose to manage their farms to obtain the benefits of no-till farming. There was a few people that screamed loud enough in the state that said, I'm no-till, been no-till for 20 years, and I'm using manure, or have used manure, and now you're going to tell me I have to do something to incorporate it. So this was put in, and again, soil health and a lot of other reasons, you know, you're saying, what's the trade-off? I'm doing something good over here, but is it hurting something over here? So this was added, and again, if you're... I haven't encountered a lot of people that are 100% no-till all the time, and that's really who that doesn't have to incorporate. So the logic is if you know you're going to do some kind of tillage, again, we're encouraging minimum incorporation, vertical tillage, phoenix harrows, you know, pretty flexible, but something to get it off the surface. It's generally agronomically to your benefit, but in, from the regulatory standpoint, and because, again, it helps get some of those nutrients less interaction with surface movement of water under the wrong circumstance. Again, MDA reserved the right in those regulations to require incorporation on case by case. In reality, that usually comes to light if it's an odor issue. In other words, to try to re remediate the situation, they may come in and say that. I haven't dealt with that yet myself. In those same regulations, they opened up the fall Spreading dates, and again, that's geared to fall manure that um, you don't have storage for. You need to do something with it to kind of get you through the winter because in reality, we have a winter restriction. And they opened up, used to be if once upon a time, we had a difference between what side of the bay you were on, um, which to me never made any sense, but that's what it was. Well, that went away, thank God, and they opened the window up. If you can remember, we were regulated to stop about November the 15th. I think it was backed up to November the 5th there for a while. In reality, now it's through December the 15th. That's the cutoff. So basically winter, where you've got a true no nutrient application restriction, is now December the 16th through February 28th instead of November the 15th through February 28th. In other words, trying to get you to, through the winter. Again, so they open that up to a little bit more. Uh, again, if you're a small, small dairy, small operation with less than 50 animal units, and that was put into regulations in the beginning, you actually have until 2020. They gave them a little more time to get storage if they didn't have it. Um, and needless to say, if there's an emergency, you know, there's always that emergency that comes to light that we have to deal with. Again, all nutrient applications in the fall and the winter, if we're assuming we're under emergency or we got something that we can't stock pile and we're not mandated to be doing it yet, they need to be applied to an existing crop or vegetative cover. And again, the cover has to be established no later than November the 15th. No nutrient applications to fallow ground regardless of crop residue. So in other words, it's got to be what someone thinks is a live crop. So in a nutshell, if you were in that scenario and you've got liquid dairy, you got any kind of liquid manure, you got limited storage, I got to try to make this thing get me till March 1 or maybe after because just because March 1 and the calendar says you can go, field conditions may not allow. So you're trying to get everything out in the fall. The mentality, and I think most of us would agree, is fall seem to be getting warmer longer. Crops are growing a little better in the fall in December 1st than they did maybe 15, 20 years ago. So that was part of the justification that MDA used to convince the powers to be to let this happen. Um, trust me, everybody don't agree with it, but that's where we are. Um, but needless to say, if you know you're going to spread manure November the 1st, you go out, you spread your manure, you plant your cover crop. No problem. In other words, you can put it on corn residue. If you know I'm going to have to spread after November the 15th, you need to be planning ahead. So in other words, you got to get your cover crop in the ground by November the 15th, so you got a place to spread your manure or some other vegetative cover come December the 1st. Because you can do it, but you got to have that cover in. In other words, we don't want you to go work up your ground December the 15th to incorporate your manure and spread your manure and then plant your cover, because most of us know we probably ain't going to see it. Maybe it's spring, but it's certainly not going to see it in the fall. So just things to be aware of. Um, it added in there, there's no spreading on frozen ground. It used to use the word hard frozen, and we ran into that. Well, what's hard frozen versus soft frozen? 
So basically it clarified it a little bit and it says no spreading of any nutrients on frozen ground and that is greater than two inches. So if it's frozen on a surface, no big deal. You legally can do it as long as it ain't the winter, as long as you're doing it according to your plan. You know, that doesn't restrict you. Or it says snow cover greater than, a, than an inch. And that's any time of the year. If it freezes in June or we get an inch of snow in June, it applies in June. I don't think that's going to happen, but if it does, just in case, you know, that's, we may have to change the regulations. It added in about emergency winter applications. Um, and it basically what it says, if we have to put manure out in the winter under a what I call an emergency situation, we did the best planning we could do. But I hate to use the word stuff happened. Um, and we got a lagoon, for an example, that's maybe going to run over before March 1. We got to do something with it. So it's allowing you to go out. In that scenario, if you can spread manure, there are restrictions in that scenario. But one restriction is you have to stay at least 100 foot from surface water during that winter period out there. So it's backing you up from where someone thinks water is going to move more than normal. Again, if you're doing something in the winter, the operator is actually required to contact MDA, your regional specialist, so we are aware and we can work together and come up with a plan. The ultimate thing is we're trying to eliminate as much risk in that as possible. As far as we can from the water, at least 100 feet. Limit your rates of application, maybe cut them in half to what we were going to do, and instead of spreading it on 10 acres, we're going to spread it on 20. Anything, all those are potential things, but there are limitations. Again, at least 100 foot, your rate of application cannot exceed one year's worth of phosphorus removal or 50 pounds of plant available nitrogen for the crop that's coming later. In other words, I'm out there in January, I'm putting it out under an emergency situation, but my next crop's going to be corn in the spring. Depending on that crop, it's yield, we're going to say, okay, here's the maximum worth of phosphorus in that, and whatever it is, you can't do more than 50 pounds of N. So you may, I'm making stuff up, you may be able to put 10,000 gallons of dairy manure on this cornfield come March 1, but in the winter you might be limited to 3,000 gallons to the acre, which basically says until we get to March 1, that's your limit. You can, if, if that's applicable, come March 1, you can go back and put the other 7,000 on. That's fine. But it's some winter limitations, you know, reducing risk as much as possible. And again, anything that does go out in the winter has to be accounted for and reduced from what's going out in the spring. So if you go out in the winter and put 50 pounds of nitrogen on, you're taking a risk to say that's 50 pounds I don't get to make up in spring on my corn. You can't just say, well, it rained and it's gone because ultimately we're trying to keep you out from doing that. But if it happens, we have to do with it. Again, winter you can't put anything on ground that has a slope greater than 7%. Probably doesn't apply to most of you in this room, but it applies to some parts of the state. And again, a 100 foot step back from surface water. Keeping people in compliance with nutrient management. Again, currently is annual report, but keep your plans up to date. Keep records of all nutrient applications you make, whether it's fertilizer, manure, and hopefully applied per the nutrient management plan. But keep records of all yields that you harvest because that's supporting your yield goals in your plan when need be. If you're not doing anything what I call too far out of the ordinary, it doesn't get looked at greatly because we're not scrutinizing you right down to the last bushel, but you know, you got to be reasonable. You can't say I'm going to grow 300 bushel of corn and you've never grown more than 175 in your life just so you can theory your nutrient management plan says I can put on more nutrients. You know, that's that's not acceptable. So again, keep track of your yields. Follow any setback requirements. Again, they're going to be in your plan. If your consultant said you don't need one, then don't worry about it. If I come along later and say, well, I think you do, then I'm going to work with the consultant and we're going to figure it out. And then again, keep your voucher current if it's applicable. Uh, and like I say today, the key is sign that sign-in sheet back there. If you are expired as far as a voucher, once that gets through the system, you should get a card. If you are not expired, the credits will sit there. You'll get your two hours. Let's just say you're going to expire at the end of 2018. Come late 2018, MDA should just issue you a card based on the credits that we sit in there. Once you get renewed, every time you get renewed, the slate gets wiped clean. So you could have, you need two hours. You could have four hours. We're going to take two of them to renew you, but the other two are going to get thrown in the trash. In other words, you got to get two hours in a three-year period every time you renew, if that makes sense to you. 
Um, Tony already touched on this. Basically, that form that he just touched on, I've got forms up there if someone wants them. If you feel like you need one, didn't get one. But again, it's a max requirement. Max is Maryland Ag cost share. It's basically anything you're going to go to the district and sign up for, in a sense. Uh, it's a requirement of a current nutrient management plan certification that has just come to light in January of 2018. So it's a brand new thing. It's participation, a requirement in any cost share reprograms requires completion of the form. At the time of application, you're supposed to bring it to the Soil Conservation District. Again, it's now in effect and it includes manure transport, manure injection will apply to the 2018-19 cover crop program. That's the one you're going to sign up for in June, not for one you're already in. Um, again, a copy of a current nutrient management plan is not required for with the certification.